Well, heart-based living, you hear more, a lot of people talking about the heart now more than ever and talking about it in different ways. Heart-based living is really the process of using what we call the intelligence of the heart to help, make us, help, help us make the decisions that we need to make in life big and small, to give us the ability to have a greater intuitive sense of what we're doing, a sensitivity to ourselves, a sensitivity to others and to our environment. Also, a greater ability to, to utilize this wonderful thing we have called emotion in ways that serve us rather than challenge us. Uh, heart-based living leads to improved health, uh, greater well-being, increased performance, a lot of things. But it all goes back to a simple premise that's been around for thousands of years, which is really listening to and following the direction of the heart. And I know that sounds somewhat philosophical, and it is. But with us, we, we have seen the heart as more than just a philosophical uh, concept. It's certainly something that's not just soft and sweet. Uh, we see it as a very powerful intelligence, an intelligence that all of us have, that we were born with, an intelligence that, um, that does give us that guidance. It's our own best friend, really, and our most reliable guide for making the decisions we need to make. Uh, it's an intelligence that we uh, often lose as we go through the roar of ambition and survival. We begin to live from the neck up, and we lose connection to this core power. When we return to it, which is not as hard as it may sound, uh, something magnificent begins to happen, and we begin to approach life in a new way. And that is really the essence of heart-based living. We see ourselves, we see others, we, uh, we see the world in a new way when we're operating from the heart. Do you think that the, uh, the importance of the heart, uh, as you alluded to, have been kind of neglected in our uh, common sphere of knowledge uh, around the world, or are there still some parts of the world, uh, according to you, that, that holds this uh, tradition, so to speak? Well, it's been neglected somewhat, but it's stuck around as well. You think about it, you know, uh, well, the earliest writings I've seen about the heart being more than a blood pump go back 4,500 years ago to ancient Chinese writings. And the view of heart as something more than a pump, uh, as a source of intelligence, was really the predominant way heart was looked at through many thousands of years. It was in the late 1500s that an English physician, Dr. William Harvey, did us all a great service. He came along and he published the first research showing that the physical heart was a four-chambered organ pumping blood through the body. And as his work became popular, uh, people that reported on it said things like, when Harvey's work was popularized, that heart lost its thought, and thought lost its heart. And what that means is that through the process of medical reductionism, people began to see the heart as only a pump and began to assign all intelligence to the brain. But even with that going on, we all have a, an intuitive sense that there's more going on with the heart. And all the great poets and philosophers and musicians and many people, great thinkers, have often referred to the heart in ways that imply that it is certainly more than a pump. Now, we looked at this, and uh, when we, long before we founded HeartMath, we were people that were interested in improving our own lives. How can we be better people? How can we serve others? Uh, we had strong motivation to improve ourselves and to, uh, to be of service. So we looked at all various systems and schools of thought to determine you know, what information would be valuable to us. And one of the things that we noticed was is that the heart was being referred to in many of the great systems, the great philosophies, the great religions, all of those, uh, th those things were referring to heart as something more. So we began to explore the heart ourselves. And what we found was is that at an energetic level, not just the physical level, but an energetic level, emotional level, spiritual connection level, and even physical level, the heart is certainly more than just a pump. And that's what led us to begin to do the scientific research to look at the physical heart, for starters, and map out and see if there was a communication pathway that was taking place between the heart and the brain and the body. And we found research that was out there in the world that nobody had sort of paid attention to. Uh, we did our own research, we brought together researchers from around the world, and we definitively uh, have shown now that even at the physical level, the heart is an amazing part of our physiology that's doing more than pumping blood. And that research is probably what we're most famous for, Heinrich, is that, um, is that we showed that the heart, in fact, does communicate to the brain and the rest of the body. Tell us a little bit about the, also, maybe, if you will, the, about the relationship between the heart and the brain then, because what I've heard is that the heart actually carries a higher, I think it is microvolt uh, than the brain does. Is that true? 
Well, that's one way of looking at it. I mean, the heart is an electrical organ. It produces by far the strongest source of bioelectricity in our bodies, up to 40 to 60 times stronger than the second most powerful source, which, in fact, is the brain. The heart sends these powerful healing commands throughout the body. It does it in four ways, and I'd be glad to briefly describe those if you'd like me to for your listeners. Yeah, please do. Well, it has a nervous system, for starters, a very complex nervous system studied through the field of what's called neurocardiology. This nervous system sends information from the heart to the brain, and, it, and that information travels all the way through the brain and terminates up in our higher perceptual centers in the brain, what's called the neocortex. The brain does send information down to the heart, which controls the timing of the heartbeat. But when researchers map out the neurological traffic in our bodies, it's clearly seen that the heart is sending a lot more information to the brain than it's receiving from the brain. And that's just one way. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the second way is biophysical. If listeners now just place their finger on their, on their wrist, they'll feel their pulse. The pulse is actually a wave of energy created by the heart. It pushes the blood through the veins and arteries. It's called a blood pressure wave. And this blood pressure wave, again, travels throughout the entire system and influences various organs in the body. One of the organs that it influences is the brain. Changes in the blood pressure wave modulate or affect electrical activity in our physical brain. And that's the second way. The third way is hormonally or biochemically. In 1983, the heart was actually reclassified as part of our hormonal system. And it produces several hormones. One's called atrial peptide. It's a very powerful hormone that's responsible for the, uh, the reduction of a stress hormone called cortisol. It also produces oxytocin, which is generically called the love hormone. And these first three ways, Heinrich, are like hardwired biological communication pathways. And it shows... For starters, if the heart is sending a lot more information to the brain and the rest of the body, the blood pressure waves are affecting the brain and the body, hormonally it's affecting things, all of this is happening from the heart, and that's just biological uh, communication. The fourth way is where it gets really interesting to me. You asked about it earlier, about the heart producing you know, microvolts of electricity, mm -hmm. and it's an electrical organ. It produces an electromagnetic field that surrounds our body in 360 degrees all around the entire body. And that electromagnetic field is strong enough that not only does it radiate to every single cell in our body, but it radiates beyond the skin out into space. And researchers, have, uh, ver they vary on how far they say they've measured this electromagnetic field. In my book, The Heart Math Solution, researchers at the Menninger Clinic said they'd uh, measured it 8 to 10 feet away. Our researchers using magnetrometers say that they've measured it three to four feet out. But regardless, we're generating a field that extends beyond our skin into space. And this is a, uh, not an RR, or subtle energy. This isn't even into quantum physics at this point. This is very measurable electromagnetic energy, kind of like radio waves. Now, taking a step further, the components of that electromagnetic field, the frequency, so to speak, will change depending upon our emotional state. When we are feeling strong negative emotions like anger or frustration, you see a, a very incoherent frequency pattern in the field. When we are experiencing emotions that have long been metaphorically associated with the word heart, like care, compassion, love, appreciation, those kind of feelings it produces a different electromagnetic signature in the field, a more coherent signature. So in a sense, where it gets interesting is we are literally broadcasting our emotions to ourselves and then out into space through this electromagnetic field produced by the heart. Hmm. Now the question becomes, how does my field affect the field of the brain? How does my field affect or is affected by the fields of other people? How does nature interact with the fields produced by the heart, and then ultimately, how does the collective heart field environment created by humanity interact with the fields produced by planet Earth itself? Hmm. And this is where it gets, this is why I said earlier, this is where it gets interesting to me, yeah. because yeah. now we move beyond hardwired biology into something that's got huge implication and goes beyond 
even the, the electromagnetic information, but into things like quantum physics, like how far does this field really go? Does it go beyond the fields uh, bound by time and space? This is where it gets exciting and interesting, and it all comes back again to the heart.